Hello everyone, welcome to the Street Crime UK YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more exciting true crime content. Today we'll be looking at a criminal case. The killing of a teenager, Ben Michael Kinsella, that changed the history of knife crime in the UK. He was a 16 year old student at Holloway School who was stabbed to death in an attack by three men in June 2008 in Islington. The significant media attention around his murder, which was also a 17th stabbing death of a teenager in London in 2008, led to a series of anti-knife crime demonstrations and raised a profile for the government's anti-knife crime maxim, Operation Blunt 2, and a review of UK knife crime sentencing laws. Mr. Ben Michael Kinsella was born on the 27th of October 1991. He was born the son of a cab driver, George Kinsella, and his wife Deborah, a school secretary. He has a half-brother, three half-sisters, and a younger full sister. Like his older half-sister, Miss Brooke Kinsella, who played Kelly Taylor in the BBC soap opera EastEnders from 2001 to 2004, Mr. Kinsella had been involved in acting, and he had a bit of a part as Tyrone Dooley in a 2004 episode of The Bill. He was a popular and academically gifted student. Friends spoke of his caring and comical nature, adding he was full of energy and that he was the life and soul of his class. Before his death, Mr. Kinsella had become concerned about knife crime after being threatened whilst working part-time at Zebedee's Cafe in Islington, where he prevented the theft of a mountain bike. He wrote a letter to the UK's then Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, as part of his English GCSE coursework, urging him to stamp out knife crime and suggesting parenting classes, curfews and youth clubs as possible solutions. The letter was later forwarded to Mr Brown by his family. He had also written a creative writing piece in which he ironically imagined his own death from stabbing. In August 2008 it was reported that he had passed all of his GCSEs, receiving two grade A stars, three A's, four B's and one C. As an aspiring graphic designer, Mr. Kinsella had also produced a design of the letter K that became a symbol against knife crime violence. Brooke Kinsella was born on the 19th of July 1988 and is a British actress, author and anti-knife crime campaigner. She is the half-sister of Mr. Kinsella, a graduate of the Anna Scher Theatre School Miss Brooke has been acting since childhood. She has had various roles on television and in film. Her most notable role is that of Kelly Taylor, who featured in BBC's long-running soap opera EastEnders between 2001 and 2004. She has her own drama school called True Stars Academy. She made her television debut at the age of seven in the BBC's children's series Mud, and has appeared in a variety of other TV productions, including Coming Home, as well as appearing in an episode of the BBC series Sunburn in 2000. She has also appeared in the entirely unrelated music video Sunburn by British rock band Muse. Film credits include the film The Kid in the Corner about a child suffering with ADHD and the controversial ITV film No Child of Mine in which she played a young girl subjected to systematic sexual abuse. Miss Brooke's father left the family when she was four years old, and she was subsequently raised by her mother, Miss Debbie, and stepfather, Mr George, who Miss Brooke described as her real dad. She lives in Islington, North London, and is the oldest of four children. She has two sisters, Jade and Georgia, apart from Ben. Miss Brooke married her long-term partner, Mr Simon Bordley, on the 28th of December 2017. And on 22nd of September 2020, she gave birth to their first child, a daughter, Elsie Rose Georgia Bordley. On the 28th of June 2008, Mr. Kinsella was out celebrating the end of his GCSE exams with friends in Shilly Beer's Brasserie Bar, which is now called the Depot N7, located at North Road in the heart of London. During this time, an altercation broke out between his friend, Mr. Alfie, and a man named Osman Ozdemir over the phrase, what are you looking at? Having been separated by a door supervisor, a friend of Mr. Ozdemir's, Mr. Jade Brathwaite, was heard saying phrases including, tell your boy if he wants trouble, I've got my tool on me and it will open you up. I'll stab people up. If you want it, I'll give it to you. Don't you know who I am? Mr. Braithwaite was also said to be frequently motioning to the inside of his jeans as if he had a weapon. 
The altercation between Mr. Alfie and Mr. Ozdemir went outside the bar, where Mr. Ozdemir and another of Mr. Braithwaite's friends were glassed. Braithwaite and his friends subsequently fled the scene, and shortly before 2am on the 29th of June, Mr. Kinsella and his friends decided to return home. When they noticed they were being followed, his friends began to run. Mr. Kinsella, however, did not, as he knew he had nothing to do with the earlier disturbance. He then crossed over the road in order to distance himself. He was then jointly cornered between the two white vans by Mr. Braithwaite, Mr. Michael Aleen and Mr. Jurass Kika as the three closed in on him, he was heard pleading, what are you coming over to me for? I haven't done anything. Moments later, Mr. Kinsella was kicked and punched to the ground and then slashed with a knife, receiving 11 stab wounds to the chest and back in a period witnesses testified to be only a five second duration. In this brutal attack, two wounds entered his lungs, causing his lung to collapse and another inflicted with such force that it went straight through his third rib, splitting it before entering the top of his heart. His pulmonary artery had also been punctured and some of his wounds were nearly 7 inches deep. His hands also suffered stab wounds, indicating that he tried to fend off the knives. CCTV footage showed Kinsella stagger from the scene where he was supported by his friend, Lewis, son of the Birds of a Feather actress, Linda Robson. Mr Kinsella was pronounced dead at 7.24 in the morning as a result of massive blood loss from numerous stab wounds. It was re reported that Mr. Kinsella had lost almost all the blood in his body. After Mr. Kinsella's murder, an estimated 400 teenagers joined a demonstration to highlight concerns over the UK's growing knife crime culture. 16-year-old Brooke Dunford organised the event via Facebook, and the youth marched from Islington Town Hall to the site of Mr. Kinsella's murder at the junction of North Road and York Way passing by Shilly Beer's nightclub in silence. The crowd were here chanting, What are we here for? Ben. Why are we here? No knives. Kinsella's funeral was attended by around a thousand mourners, including public figures such as Miss Michelle Ryan, Miss Gillian Tailforth, and Mr. James Alexandru. The Kinsella family made numerous media appearances campaigning against knives and set up a trust in memory of Ben to raise awareness of the effects of gun and knife crime, which we'll be looking at in greater detail in a bit. Three men were accused and later convicted of Mr Kinsella's murder. First up was Mr J. Darrell Braithwaite of Bow, London. Mr Braithwaite was aged 19 at the time of Mr Kinsella's murder and 20 at the time of sentencing. With a height of 6 foot 6, Mr Braithwaite had hoped to become a professional goalkeeper and played in an Islington Youth League until its closure when he was 14. He had also worked as a coach at a local leisure centre prior to the murder. Mr Braithwaite had a reprimand for possession of cannabis and was convicted of attempted theft of a laptop computer from a fellow teenager. He was given a one-year detention and training order in 2006, but during 2007 his sentence was cut on appeal to community service. Next was Mr Michael Lee Roy Aleen. Mr Aleen of Islington, London was aged 18 both at the time of Mr Kinsella's murder and at the time of sentencing. He had been released three months earlier from a young offender institution and was under the supervision of the council's youth offending team at the time of the murder. Mr. Aleen had a criminal record including shoplifting, robbery, motor vehicle theft and drug dealing of crack cocaine and heroin. Mr. Aleen's electronic tag was removed just weeks prior to the attack. He had also previously been in custody for robbery of a mobile phone. He was also known to terrorise council estate tenants with his two Staffordshire Bull Terrier dogs. Mr. Aleen is also alleged to have pulled a gun on a young member of his own gang. The third perpetrator, Mr. Jurass Kika, Mr. Kika of Islington, London, was aged 18 at the time of Kinsella's murder and 19 at the time of sentencing, by which time he had become a father. He was the son of an Angolan minicab driver named Jao and was mostly raised by his mother. He was first cautioned aged 11, the same year he stabbed 14-year-old Mr. Robert Parker in the back with a 3-inch blade before calmly walking away. Although he was not prosecuted because of his age, Mr. Kiko was on the run from police for a stabbing and robbery incident over a drugs argument nine days prior to the murder. He had also received convictions for robbery, a fray and obstructing a constable. All three of them were unemployed at the time of the murder and have all alleged to have been involved in the same drug dealing group named Market Massive. A journalist investigating the group claimed Mr. Aline to be the gang's leader and Mr. Braithwaite as an enforcer and Mr. Kika as a foot soldier. 
is also claimed that the gang set up dogfights to gamble on. Conflicts also existed between them and another gang who pistol whipped Mr. Aline. The prosecution amassed a large amount of evidence, and that was used during the seven week trial. All three defendants were witnessed running together at Mr. Kinsella prior to the murder, and later standing together shortly afterwards. Mr. Aline, Mr. Kika, was then seen to going to Mr. Aline's father's flat. This flat was raided by police shortly afterwards, but Mr. Aline and Mr. Kika had already walked through a police cordon and fled to Mr. Aline's cousin's flat in Chadwell Heath, where they were apprehended after running along rooftops. Mr. Aline's father had originally indicated that Mr. Aline and Mr. Kika returned to the flat around 2.30am, but changed his statement six months later claiming that it was confused due to an injury he received during the raid itself. When giving testimony, Aline's father admitted that his son had said to him, if it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't be in this mess. Several of Mr. Kinsella's friends also testified about Mr. Braithwaite's activities in Shilly Beer's nightclub. Mr. Aline's cousin, Kelly, later claimed that Mr. Aline and Mr. Kika had confessed the murder to her. The police never found the murder weapon or weapons involved. However, 72 spots of Mr. Kinsella's blood were later identified on a pair of Mr. Aline's jeans that he handed to his sister's disposal. And traces were also found on Mr. Kika's belt. No forensic evidence was found in relation to Mr. Braithwaite. However, police found some of his clothes had been washed in bleach. After handing himself in to the police, Mr. Braithwaite first claimed that he did not know either Mr. Aline or Mr. Kika. Later, he claimed that he had seen Mr. Aline that stabbed Mr. Kinsella, but he had not been involved himself. He stated that Mr. Aline had a reputation for using weapons and was concerned about the impact that telling the police would have upon his family. Both Mr. Aline and Mr. Kika answered no comment to all questions asked during the police interviews. Aware that his cousin, Miss Kelly, was going to give evidence against him, Mr. Aline wrote a threatening letter to her from jail, reading, To Slag, aka Snitch, you are a letdown to the family, you are not my cousin, believe that. How are you going to give my letters to Boyd M and be snitching on me? You're not real at all. When will I see you? Your mum's still on the road, so be careful how you move. You don't know how I move on the road. I'm a boss. People in North know who I am. Fuck that. When this shit hits the fan, you snitch. I don't know who the fuck you are. You don't try and keep me out of jail. I'm a real gangster, and you ask your dad about me. He's seen things. Your best hope, I don't bust a case, because people will be in trouble, and you will never snitch on anyone again. I promise you that. Say no more, I'm a ghost. I ain't got time to write the snitches. Family that's not real. I've got your statements. Everyone I know that Kelly is a snitch. You see, snitches get touched. You see blood. Tottenham, ride or die. All the family knows you're a snitch, so if I get found guilty, it's down to you. This letter subsequently became a major part of the Crown's case against Mr. Aline. Police obtained a license to record Mr. Braithwaite and Mr. Aline and Mr. Kika in the back of a police van, where they were able to establish that the three knew each other. Mr. Braithwaite is heard on the tape trying to bribe the others to say he was not there, and also revealed on the tape that the Clerkenwell Crime Syndicate, better known as the Adams Family, had made threats against Mr. Kinsella's murderers, indicating that each was a marked man. Kika was also here discussing getting a teardrop, alleged to be referring to a teardrop tattoo to mark him as having killed someone, and discussing fixing the person who records the CCTV for the area. Kika is also here saying, See, when it happened, yeah, it was kind of like a quick thing, like boom, went down the road, came back up, boom, finished. You get what I'm saying? Apparently in relation to the murder itself. Additionally, Mr. Aline was here on the tape discussing disposing of evidence. Up to that point and during the trial, each blamed the other for the fatal stabbing. The recording showed they were in it together. They were taped fixing up a story. Mr. Nicholas Hillard QC told the Old Bailey in London, in extracts played to the jury, the three men discussed alibis, potential witnesses, CCTV evidence and getting rid of their mobile phones. Mr. Aline, known as Tigger, or T, seemed to describe how he took part in the knife attack before reassuring his friends that evidence had been disposed of. Mr. Braithwaite, who was involved in the dispute of one of Ben's friends shortly before the murder, asked his co-defendants to say that he was not with them that night. Mr. Aline was to later insist that he was at his yard, asleep at the time, even though his father told police he had gone out. Hillard told the jury, Braithwaite is saying, I wasn't with T, I was somewhere else. T will say that he was at his yard and his dad has got it wrong. 
That's what this is all about. This is fixing up a story to get away with murder. There is no falling out or blaming each other, nothing like that. They are getting their story straight. Mr. Aline, a heavy cannabis smoker, fell out with his father after he spoke to police. On the 13th of October 2008, all three defendants pleaded not guilty to the charge of murder. A seven-week trial began at the Old Bailey on the 27th of April 2009. The judge was the Common Sergeant of London, Brian Barker QC. The Crown Prosecution Service was represented by Mr. Nicholas Hillard QC and Mr. Duncan Penny. During the course of the trial, both Mr. Braithwaite and Mr. Aline took the witness stand. Mr. Braithwaite claimed that Mr. Kinsella had thrown a punch at him, although there was no supporting evidence for this. After this, Mr. Braithwaite claimed that he saw Mr. Aline carry out the murder. Mr. Braithwaite also claimed that a friend of Mr. Aline had punched him in the cells of the Old Bailey whilst he was handcuffed to a wall. Mr. Aline claimed that he had been contacted by Mr. Braithwaite and asked to back him following a dispute at Shilly Beers. Although no phone records identified a call between Mr. Braithwaite and Mr. Aline prior to the attack, Mr. Kika exercised his right of silence and did not take the witness stand. Having retired to consider their verdict on 9th of June, the jury returned on the 11th of June with a unanimous verdict of guilty in relation to all three defendants. The victim's mother, Miss Deborah Kinsella, then read out a victim impact statement in court following the verdict, the full text of which can be found online. At the Old Bailey on the 12th of June 2009, Judge Brian Barker QC sentenced Mr. Braithwaite, Mr. Aline and Mr. Kika each to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 19 years. Passing sentence, the judge described the attack on Mr. Kinsella as brutal, cowardly and totally unjustified, adding that your blind and heartless anger that night defies belief. He continued saying that there was no possible excuse for such an arrogant and unfeeling attack on someone who had done nothing. He also condemned them for picking on an obviously younger and smaller lone victim and for their total lack of remorse. The defendants were jeered by members of the public in the public gallery. Mr. Kika and Mr. Aline gestured back at the gallery as if they were firing guns. Angry scenes also took place between the victims and defendants' families after one of the accused mothers spat on Mr. Kinsella's cousin Sam while shouting, I love you baby. Another person connected to one of the accused attempted to kick one of Mr. Kinsella's friends in the head. After the trial, Kinsella family called for stronger sentences for knife crimes. Mr. Kinsella's father was quoted as saying, If you murder someone with a gun, the starting tariff is 30 years, but if you do it with a knife, it's 15 years. The UK Secretary of State for Justice, Jack Straw, agreed to carry out a review of knife crime sentencing laws shortly afterwards. The Kinsella family said to them, Life should mean life. Although it is not possible in English law to give a whole life tariff to murderers under the age of 21, a review of the sentencing by the Attorney General for England and Wales, Baroness Scotland, determined that the sentencing would not be referred to the Court of Appeal as unduly lenient. A 50-minute documentary entitled My Brother Ben, Brooke Kinsella's story was aired on BBC One on the 16th of June 2009. It followed Miss Brooks Kinsella's investigation of the underlying causes of knife crime during the period from her brother's death to the end of the court case. Miss Brooke also travelled to New York to see prisons using short, sharp shock treatments to rehabilitate young offenders. The documentary also points out the success of Operation Blunt 2, which carried out over 290,000 stops and searches, leading to over 10,000 arrests and the confiscation of over 5,500 knives within the timeline of the documentary. A book by Miss Brooke Kinsella entitled Why Ben? A sister story of heartbreak and love for the brother she lost was released on the 3rd of September 2009. Do check out the book to gain more insider information about the murder and trials. On the 28th of June 2009, it was reported that all three killers were set to appeal against their sentences, stating the tariff was too harsh. They claimed that the publicity surrounding the case was a factor in their sentences. On the 13th of November 2009, Mr. Kika lost his appeal to challenge his 19 year sentence. He argued his sentence was manifestly excessive. However, the Lord Judge Mr. Justice Penry Davy and Mr. Justice Henriques rejected this statement, saying that the term could not remotely be described as excessive. They concluded that there is no true mitigation. There was no guilty plea, no remorse, and no insight into the devastation that had been caused. 
They accepted that the applicant was young when the murder was committed, but added that Mr. Kika knew exactly what they were doing. They all did. They were all equally involved. They all intended to kill the young victim. They had hunted him down and mercilessly done him to death to avenge an insignificant slight for which he bore no responsibility whatsoever. They stated that Mr. Kinsella did not say or do anything which could even be misinterpreted as provocation, adding that all that this boy wanted to do was get away from trouble, but we cannot mince words, he was cut down before he could reach safety. As part of Operation Blunt 2, a metropolitan police initiative aimed at reducing knife crime that began in the spring of 2008, there was a marked increase in the number of weapon searches conducted in London. London boroughs were assigned to one of three tiers based on intelligence of the knife crime problem. Resources were prioritised to 10 tier 1 boroughs, and to a lesser extent to 6 tier 2 boroughs. The 10 tier 1 boroughs recorded a more than threefold increase in the number of weapon searches, up from 34,154 in the year before, to 123,335 in the first year of Operation Blunt. Over this period, the 16 tier 3 boroughs also recorded an increase in weapon searches, but on a smaller scale, up by 18,103, an 87% increase on the pre Blunt 2 levels. However, in 2021, a surge in stop and search activity by the Metropolitan Police Service, or MPS, had no noticeable crime reducing effects at local level, a Home Office study had found. Experts examined the impact of an initiative aimed at reducing knife crime in 2008 and 2009 that saw a sharp jump in weapon searches carried out in the capital. At the time, officers were carrying out one search every 20 seconds on average nationwide. The analysis focused on nine measures of police recorded crime, including different types of assault, involving sharp instruments, robbery with weapons, drug possession, and drugs possession offences, and three types of acquisitive crime. The greater use of weapon searches was not effective at the borough level for reducing crime. Overall, analysis showed that there were no discernible crime reducing effects from a large surge in stop and search activity at the borough level during the operation. The study was based on data at borough level with an average population of more than 200,000 per area. The use of stop and search has varied over the last decade, but at its peak in 2009, a search was undertaken every 20 seconds on average around the country. A few years ago, the issue was at the centre of controversy as the then Home Secretary, Theresa May, clashed with MPS Commissioner Sir Bernard Hogan Howe when she insisted suggestions that knife crime was rising as a result of curbs on the tactic are simply not true. The Home Office said it had introduced a number of measures since 2014 to improve the effectiveness of stop and search. There has been a significant reduction in the use of stop and search by the police in England and Wales down from a peak of 1.2 million in 2010 and 2011, when 9% led to an arrest, to 539,000 in 2014 and 2015, of which 14% resulted in an arrest. Knife crime has fallen by more than 16% since 2011, although that includes a 9% increase recorded by the police in the last 12 months. A Home Office spokesperson said, The government is clear that the power of stop and search when used correctly is vital in the fight against crime. However, when it is misused, stop and search is counterproductive and a waste of police time. Stop and search must be applied fairly, effectively and in a way that builds community confidence rather than undermining it. No one should be stopped on the basis of their race, ethnicity or sexuality. This particular study showed that there were no discernible crime reducing effects from a large surge in stop and search activity at the borough level during the operation. In May 2008, the MPS under the direction of former Commissioner Sir Ian Blair launched the second anti-knife crime initiative, Operation Blunt 2, backed by a 75 strong task force that searched 5,395 people and recovered 231 knives in its first four days. At the time, the newly elected Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, said, Tackling violent crime is my number one priority, and I'm keen to explore everything and anything which could help combat it. After agreeing on request by the Kinsella family and due to the public outrage surrounding the case, Justice Secretary Jack Straw announced the minimum tariff for murders committed with a knife would rise from 15 years to 25 years and this happened in 2010. This new development was being called Ben's Law, 
and Ben's father, Mr. George, hoped that the new law would act as a deterrent to anyone thinking of carrying a knife. Sentences for various violent crimes have been getting tougher over the years. New guidelines which came into effect at the start of June 2011 mean any adult convicted of possessing a knife or acid for use as an offensive weapon is likely to face a longer prison term. The recommendations of the Sentencing Council are that anyone over the age of 18 who is caught with a bladed article in a public place should be jailed for at least 6 months. For juveniles, the suggested tariff is 4 months. Mr Patrick Green of the Ben Kinsella Trust said that although appropriate sentencing is important, it would not solve the problem. He described the current levels of violence involving knives as depressing, adding that it was hard to have any positives about what is going on at the moment. The sad thing is, it's not a flick of a switch, it's not going to change overnight. Measures will take time to bear fruit, and there needs to be significant investment from the public purse. Prevention plays such a big role, no young person is born with a knife in their hand. It is a learned behaviour, and if we do far more at the beginning to either help them understand better behaviours, or unlearn those destructive behaviours, then that will make a significant difference. In 2018, at least 49 people were fatally stabbed in London, and during the first four months of 2018, there were 1,296 stabbings in the capital, according to the Met Police data. To help combat knife crime, the Ben Kinsella Trust has launched an interactive workshop that aims to educate young people by guiding them through five crime-themed rooms. The final room is a prison cell, which features an actor who can be a bit unnerving. The children usually want to get out of the room quite quickly, but what we teach is that you could be in a room like that for four or more years and you don't get to pick your cellmate. Friday the 29th of June, on the 10th anniversary of the teenager's death, it's being kept free of public events to allow his family to remember him. Life without Ben has been life changing, his sister said. People say that time is a healer, but I don't think it is in these scenarios. We will all just continue to live his life for him. We will never stop campaigning and trying to educate people about the dangers of knife crime. We hope the walk will mirror our earlier peace marches against knife crime. We want to keep Ben's memory alive and show as a society that there's still a problem in our city. The Ben Kinsella Trust educates young people on the dangers of knife crime and helps them to make positive choices to stay safe. Their workshop follows the journey of both the victim and the offender through a series of unique and immersive experiences to show young people how choices and consequences are intrinsically linked. Their workshops change young people's attitudes to knife crime, debunking the myth that carrying a knife will protect you. They strengthen peer values, ensuring young people give better advice to each other and challenge peers who are carrying or thinking of carrying a knife. Preventing knife crime requires collective action. The trust works with young people the government and stakeholders because they recognise they cannot do this alone. Their resources for practitioners and parents are designed to empower others to work with young people on difficult and sensitive topics. The Trust also campaigns for action and justice for those affected by knife crime and their campaigns have won numerous awards in recognition of their success. Ben's big sister, Miss Brooke Kinsella, is a spokesperson for the Trust and has highlighted Ben's story with documentaries including My Brother Ben on BBC One and Can Criminals Say Sorry on BBC Three. She has also published a memoir to her brother entitled Why Ben? After Ben's death, she was given an advisory role to the coalition government and produced a report for the Home Office securing £18 million of funding for knife crime projects. Brooke was awarded an MBE for services to charity in 2012. Ben's mum, Miss Debbie Kinsella, Miss Debbie's extremely moving impactful speech on the death of her son at court was key in ensuring the perpetrators received tough sentences. Alongside her family, Debbie is doing everything she can to make sure her son's death was not in vain and is trying her hardest to stop this happening to another mother. Miss Claire Clark is a superintendent with the Metropolitan Police. She joined the trustees when she was working in Islington with responsibility for neighbourhood policing and latterly gangs and crime operations. She is a passionate exponent of education and choice and has led work in reductions in serious youth violence and knife crime across the borough. Miss Clare supports the Trust's advising on crime and legal matters, giving insight to the challenges faced by young people in today's society. Miss Gita Subramaniam Mooney joined us in 2014 following a close working relationship and supporting the Trust whilst the ex exhibition was based in Millwall. 
As head of crime reduction and supporting people in Lewisham, Ms Gita has an in-depth knowledge and experience of implementing and developing strategies on crime, drugs, antisocial behaviour, youth offending, commissioning drug and alcohol services, and supporting people's programmes. Ms Gita's specialism in this area means that she can advise the trust on youth justice and crime, engaging targeted young people, forming relationships with key partners and identifying funding streams. Ms Hana Emami works in Camden Council as part of Camden Learning. Ms Hana is passionate about social justice issues and affecting change through supporting children and young people. She was a primary school teacher for seven years, supporting children and young people to make positive choices and providing support to young people and communities in times of crisis. Hana's experience in the education sector means that she can support the trust in developing education resources and targeted accessible information for young people. Mr. Sean O'Hare is a management consultant with extensive experience of leading transformation within the public sector. He has worked in two thirds of London boroughs, in addition to numerous central government departments and agencies. In addition, Mr. Sean has worked with a number of organisations focused on improving youth opportunities and helping people move away from gangs, including Mac UK and Streets of Growth. He is committed to helping reduce knife crime in Britain through growing the essential educational work of the Ben Kinsala Trust. Mrs. Cathy Uden joined the trustee board in 2016. Her specialism is in human resources, having spent 32 years as HR manager at the Metropolitan Police. Miss Cathy brings a wealth of experience to the board, ensuring best work practices are in place at all times. Cath has been a long-standing supporter of the Trust. She is a strong advocate for youth work and providing more prevention and early intervention opportunities to young people to divert them away from knife crime. Do you think there are sufficient efforts being undertaken to reduce knife crimes in the UK? Or should more be done to protect the youth? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a like and a share and leave any thoughts or suggestions you have in the comments section. We love to read through them all. And if you're new but enjoy UK true crime content, then subscribe to see when our newest video releases. And as always, stay safe.